This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. As you know, we broadcast from beautiful old town Scottsdale. It's either heaven or hell. And right now it's heaven. Perfect. Perfect weather. But anyway, we have a very important show to you for you today. It's a person I've been really looking forward to. He's infamous throughout the world. I even spent money and bought his book online. <laughs> it's called The United States of Socialism. His name is Dinesh D'Souza. Very controversial person, but he says things that really need to be heard today. Any comments, Kim? Yes, well, I've, I've watched some of his YouTube videos, and this is going to be a fascinating discussion. Um, such such eye-opening takes on how things have developed and how we've been moving towards socialism. And Dinesh has just an amazing uh, perception of, and, and knowledge of, of what has happened and what's transpired over the years. Fascinating. So, so, let, so let, me, let me read the, this is the opening line in the back cover of your book. It says, a specter is haunting America, the specter of socialism. Suddenly out of almost out of nowhere, we encounter a melange of strange socialist characters. <laughs> Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, Rashid Tab, Iman, uh, Inan Omar, Bernie Sanders, I'd like to ask, uh, add um, Ms. Hirono from Hawaii, the dumbest senator in the world. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, and a whole political party that seems magnetically drawn towards a socialist camp. This development itself is surprisingly strange because socialism is arguably the most discredited idea in history. And so that's why I'm very excited to have Dinesh on this program because, you know, I'm a, I was a U.S. Marine. I went to Vietnam to fight socialism and communism. And Dinesh, I got into a lot of trouble when I returned from Vietnam in 73 because I was interviewed with a local paper. And they asked me what it was like to go to war. I said, geez, if I want to kill communists, I just stay home. You know? <laughs> I, didn't like, I didn't like that comment at all. <laughs> but anyway, so that's why you can say whatever you like in my program. <laughs> and Dinesh D'Souza is also an award-winning filmmaker and has been uh, one of the top young pub public policy makers in the country. What, and welcome to the show, Dinesh. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. I'm very pleased to join you. And um, yeah, I think a lot of my work is just based on the fact that I grew up in a different culture. In my case, um, Bombay, now called Mumbai, India. Um, and the left in America now says, you know, we don't want authoritarian socialism. We want democratic socialism. Well, I grew up under democratic socialism. And my family had a ration card, which basically told my mom, you can only buy so much rice and so much sugar and so much cooking oil. Um, and then our family was on a seven year waiting list to get a phone because the phone company had been nationalized by the government. So to me, socialism represents misery, uh, scarcity. Uh, India in the 70s was the begging bowl of the world. And India only began to see more prosperity when it moved away from socialism. So I saw all this in my childhood. And then only later I began to think about all this and think about what made America unique. A lot of my work has been motivated by understanding the uniqueness of America. But thank you. So um, when you see this cast of characters, <laughs> what goes through your mind? Well, there. are um, in some senses, most of these people are complete losers in the sense that they have not <laughs> accomplished anything in life. They haven't built anything. They haven't done anything. Uh, but this is not to say that they are untalented because they are talented in the art of creating a sense of grievance. They are professionals at massaging this idea that you're entitled to something, that the stuff in your neighbor's house really belongs to you. Envy is a very powerful force in human motivation. And these people are experts, starting with Obama, but continuing with the, the socialists like Ocasio-Cortez and so on. They basically give people the idea that, uh, they, that the reason they haven't achieved much is because other people have been stealing from you. Uh, and so they, um, they use socialism as a mechanism uh, for really trying to confiscate the wealth of hardworking people and entrepreneurial people and transfer it to themselves. And, and Dinesh, over time, how has this happened over time that you've seen here in the U.S.? What have been some of the milestones? Well, 
The early milestone was, of course, FDR in the 1930s. Um, what FDR discovered was the politics of fear. Now, of course, the, the depression was real, and so the fear was real. But FDR realized when people are fearful, they go into a crowd stampede, and you can get them to do things and agree to things that if they thought about it in a calm, deliberative way, they never would agree. Uh, and ever since then, the left has been trying to push the politics of fear. In the 1970s, when I first came to America, oh, the world is running out of food. In the 1980s, we're all going to be blown up in a nuclear holocaust. In the 1990s, uh, the ozone layer is going away. Uh, then the last 20 years, climate apocalypse, and now coronavirus. So in every case, they're trying to manipulate uh, fear in order to achieve a political agenda that they could not otherwise achieve. But isn't it also true that with this, um, I don't know if this pandemic is real or not. I have some suspicions about it. But anyway, <clears throat> the economy was collapsing anyway. So the coronavirus just accelerated the whole process. But isn't, you know, like one of the definitions of socialism is victims recruiting victims. And so in your experience, how accurate is that? I mean, how much does socialism require a person to feel they've been victimized? and then go out and recruit other victims. Yeah, that is absolutely the key. Now, um, what's unique about the new socialism in America is it is, I call it identity socialism, because uh, Marx uh, divided society into the rich against the poor or the working class against the capitalist class. So the victims were the working class. Right. But um, for the left today, they've created all these new categories of victims. So it's uh, white against black and male against female and straight against gay and legal against illegal. So while Marx divided society just one way, the left today divides society many different ways. And their goal is to try to create a majority coalition of oppressed victim groups. Why? <laughs> why? What's, why? Why is this the oh. agenda? Why because because um, they want to um, see the left wants democratic socialism. So for democratic socialism, you need to get to 51 percent. That's how you get political power. Then you can loot and tyrannize over the other 49 percent. But first you have to get to 51 percent. So how do you do that? Well, the left goes, OK, well, we can't just rely on the working class or the unions. In fact, today, many union guys and working class guys are to be found more likely in a Trump rally. So they've lost the working class. So they go, okay, well, how about if we get the blacks and then we get the Latinos, then we'll get the Asians, then we'll go after the gays. And the idea here is let's keep adding all these groups. Women are 51%. So if we can get a big bunch of these groups, we're gonna add up to 51%. Then we have power. And then we're gonna be able to go after the wealth and even the liberties of the remaining 49%. So, uh, you know, Dinesh, you've already made my latest book. It's called Infinite Returns. <laughs> and I've uh, quoted you. I put that little, that little uh, blurb on the, from the back cover of your book into the book. Because you, as Kim says, the definition of intelligence is, if you agree with me, you're intelligent. And you're very, very intelligent. But one of the things that uh, I am concerned about since I'm a you know, boomer and I graduated from high school in 65, I went to Vietnam, I came back, I got spit on, eggs thrown at me and all this stuff. And America had changed. So that I came back in 73. And then I went to my high school reunion in 75 and the war was still on. And I still remember going to my high school reunion and three of my closest friends were avowed communists. You know, I mean, as a U.S. Marine, you never admit you're a communist because we just shoot you. You know, I mean, it's, it's not the way you do things. But these guys are so blatantly communist. There was a Black Panthers and all this other stuff. There's no blacks in our class, but they were communists. And one turned out to be under, he was, the FBI was after him for sabotage. Uh, you know, he bombed something. The other guy was a politician and went to jail for stealing money, which is probably a Democrat. But they... <laughs> A third person became the editor of the local newspaper. And so in 1975, Dinesh, you know, probably before you were born, I, I was sitting there watching this transition come across America. And that's why when the home little papers asked me what I thought about the war, and I said, if I want to kill communists, I just go back to City Hall and shoot them there. You know, that, that, didn't, get, that didn't make me too popular. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but you're, you're touching on a key point here, which is that it's starting in the 1960s, many of these leftists who, who initially saw themselves as revolutionaries, think of a guy like Bill Ayers and his wife, Bernadine Dorn. They tried to blow up the Pentagon. Right. They were part of armed robberies. They were part of all kinds of mayhem. But uh, then they settled down and said, look, if we're going to have a revolution, the way to do that is to take over the schools and to take over the colleges. Amen, take- amen, the- amen. And so right now you see how these, I call them the big megaphones of our culture, academia, the media, Hollywood, very dominated by the left. One reason I started making movies, initially documentary films, but I've now also made a feature film that's in the theater now called Infidel. The reason I do all this is I'm trying to compete with Hollywood on its own ground. I'm trying to create because uh, very often uh, conservatives pay very little attention to culture. They allow the left to become very dominant, uh, not just in Hollywood, but the whole entertainment industry, the music industry, Broadway, all the comedians. And this means they can do a relentless propaganda drumbeat uh, that is part of the reason why even when Republicans seem to be in control, we're never in charge because the other side is still setting the agenda because they dominate the culture. Yeah, so let me ask this question, you know, in the uh, six, early 70s when I graduated from, went to school in New York, and I was in San Francisco near Berkeley, and I saw this whole culture in Berkeley shifting. And today, this is my question to you, you talk about the media, but you now have Big Brother called Silicon Valley. And, you know, this, this lately Hunter Biden's case comes up, and he's caught with his hand in the tail in the Ukraine and China and all this, but Silicon Valley or Google or YouTube or whatever, Twitter, you're not allowed to say anything. What is your opinion of that? So there are two aspects to this, one of which is a mere puzzle and the other part of which is actually very disturbing. The mere puzzle is why it is that these uh, hippie capitalists, if you want to call them that, Uh, are so wedded to the Democratic Party, because after all, they are part of the innovations of technological capitalism. And they surely can see that the Democratic Party is pulling away from capitalism and towards socialism. So that's an interesting puzzle. But of course, they have every right to be whichever on whichever side they want. This is the disturbing part. These are people who have benefited from free speech. They've created these platforms. And now that they've created these platforms, a tyrannical impulse is kicking in, in which they basically are now using these platforms to essentially throw people off digital media, disempower them, prevent them from speaking, reduce their reach. And they're willing to do this even to Republican senators, to the president of the United States, and to all kinds of ordinary people who have no recourse, who can't actually protest against this because they don't have any power compared to these guys. So how free speech suddenly became an endangered commodity in America is I think a very chilling development. And uh, nor can we count on groups like the ACLU to come to our defense because today they're part of the problem. So let me ask this, uh, let's, let's give, give a little your, your work promotion here. So what are some of your documentaries that people can subscribe to or watch or be educated from what you've, what you've talked about, what you've been talking about all these years? Well, uh, I've written a bunch of books. I mean, I think 17 at last count, the United States of Socialism being the latest one. So I would suggest starting there. With regard to the films, I've made a film on Obama called Obama's America, one on Hillary called Hillary's America. The most recent one is called Trump Card, and that's based on the United States of Socialism. Now, all my earlier films were released in the theater, but the latest one is just on demand. So you have to go to trumpcardthemovie.com You can obviously order a DVD, but you can also watch it on any device. You can watch it through Apple iTunes or Google or YouTube or the movie site called Fandango, also through Xfinity or Comcast. So many different ways to watch the movie on any device. Well, the thing I thought was interesting, because Kim and I were just at Jekyll Island, you know, where the Federal Reserve Bank was born. And there's an organization called the Red Pill. And, you know, that comes from the matrix, red pill or blue pill. And most people are sucking down the blue pills. The red pill is when you open your eyes. And there are several over there, guys like you. One guy, one guy did Vaxxed. Another one did a Plandemic and all this. But we're all social outcasts. You know, it's just, it's, it's very, very interesting. We're citizens, but we have to go into hiding like a place like Jekyll Island just to be heard with other people. 
And the first red pill I went to was four years ago. It was in Bozeman, Montana. And the press said, this, the red pill is a bunch of white supremacists. And, and I said, but I'm not white. <laughs> anyway, they have no sense of humor. Hey, when we come back to this, we're going to be talking more about we're we'll talking about the United States of Socialism and what we can do. And, 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 and I also want to talk about when we come back, um, Dinesh, you say that socialism has been attempted 20, or has happened 27 times and never has it worked, ever. And so I want to find out why are we heading down that path? Who's, who's doing this and why, why are we going in this direction? We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Today we have a very special guest. His name is Dinesh D'Souza. His latest book is called The United States of Socialism. It's probably one of the more controversial subjects you can look at or study today. Is why is America going socialism to communism? Anyway, listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes and Android. And please leave us a review when you listen. All of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive them for one reason. We are a purely educational show. We don't sell anything. And we suggest you listen. If you like what you heard in this program, listen to this one more time. You'll learn twice as much because repetition is how we learn. But also discuss it with friends, family, and business associates. It's a very, very important subject because, um, you know, Rich Dad was very apolitical. We're not Republican or Democrat, but it really disturbs me that we're losing our freedoms. We're losing our freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, possibly our guns. And that's what's happening when socialism t- takes over. And socialism has never fared. And I, st- I studied economics at school. I went to military school, Dinesh. And what we all talked about is who killed the most people, socialists or capitalists. And socialists have murdered the most people over time in any time in history. And that's where America is going now. Okay. So uh, Dinesh D'Souza is an award-winning filmmaker. His films include 2016 Obama's America and America, Imagine a World Without Her. Um, Dinesh, so I've heard you say that, you know, socialism has been attempted or actually has been instilled 27 times throughout the world and never once has it worked. Never once has it succeeded. It's always gone to murder. Like Nazi is national associates, not, so, not socialist. That so, was Hitler, Hitler's party. Yes. Yeah, so why why has it failed every time, and why are we heading in that direction? Well, the reason it's failed is because, um, by and large, um, it's based upon a, a false view of human nature, and it's also based upon turning over power to the centralized state or the central government. Now we see even in our own society that by and large, whatever the government does, it usually does badly. And this is true from the post office to the DMV to the defense department. It costs them $400 to buy a coffee maker because the government is inefficient at every level. Uh, Now socialism was tried in about a little more than half the world and all the big countries moved away from it. China, India, Russia, Uh, It produced enormous body count, um, almost 100 million casualties. Now, of course, the left will say today, we we don't want the authoritarian socialism. We want democratic socialism. Uh, But democratic socialism has also failed. It failed in India, for example, um, and it's failed in other places as well. In in Venezuela, my wife is Venezuelan. uh, The Venezuelans voted for Hugo Chavez. He came to power democratically the first time. Now, he rigged the subsequent elections, but the first one was a free election. uh, And he took this once prosperous country and ran it completely into the ground. Um, So socialism has really never worked. Uh, The left says, well, what about Scandinavia? It works in Scandinavia. Well, the Scandinavians, first of all, are capitalist in wealth creation even if they are socialist in wealth distribution. Uh, They have low corporate tax rates, 20%, about the same as here. They have no minimum wage in Scandinavia. With the exception of Norway, they have no wealth tax. They have no inheritance tax. They have less regulation than here in America. So the Scandinavians do not kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. And while they have a big welfare state, they make sure that all the citizens pay for it. The rich have to pay, the poor have to pay, the middle class has to pay. So there's none of this, let's demonize the rich, let's go after the millionaires and billionaires, let's rob Peter to pay Paul in the hope that we get Paul's vote. All of this madness that is part of American politics, you won't find in Scandinavia. And also one more thing, you won't find any Scandinavian politician Uh, who goes from zero to $100 million on a government salary the way that the Clintons have or the Bidens. 
Or Obama. Or Obama or Al Gore. Right. Anyway, you know, they make money the old-fashioned way. It's called Robin Hood. You take from the rich, they put it in their pockets. And uh, it's really disgusting. In Hawaii, you know, Forrest Magazine called Hawaii the People's Republic of Hawaii. And today in Hawaii, there's not one Republican in office. In fact, so many of my friends have left. You know, they bypassed California, and they just keep going because California has gone left. Well, always been left. So anyway, it's a very important point. You know, at the high risk of uh, censorship, what are, your, what are your thoughts on Black Lives Matter and Antifa and whatever else they got out there? Coincidence that it's all happened at the same time as COVID and it's just a crazy. It's, it's a crazy situation. I mean, the, the left has been exploiting COVID. Uh, they like the fact that there are lots of people sitting on their couch and not going to work uh, because uh, in a sense, the left would like to do to all of America what they've already done to the inner city black community, create dependent classes of people who um, rely on the government for a basic and meager provision. And in exchange, they have to give up their vote every two or four years. Now, with regard to Antifa and Black Lives Matter, these have become, at least in the, on the street, uh, paramilitary operations. I never thought I would see this in, in this country. Uh, this is a phenomenon that goes back to Europe in the 20s under Mussolini and the early Nazi party in the 30s. Like the brown, uh, the brown, they were called brown shirts and black shirts. Exactly. Uh, black shirts of Mussolini. Now, the, what made the black shirts so dangerous is that they weren't just street thugs. They were street thugs that had allies in powerful places. And the same here. Um, when these Antifa and Black Lives Matter guys show up to a riot, somebody puts bricks for them to throw at the street inter intersection. Hollywood people put up money for, the, for bail. Uh, there are lawyers on hand. There's medical personnel on hand. Uh, they have powerful friends in the mayor's office in Portland and Seattle and Berkeley and New York City. So these are a paramilitary attached to a powerful political party, and that's what makes them especially dangerous. Yeah, I was reading uh, this report on uh, Black Lives Matter. The two founders are proud to, proud to be, they proudly state they're trained to be Marxist. You know, I, I'm going, wow. Yes, and if you look at their agenda, a lot of it has nothing to do with blacks. It's things like overthrowing the patriarchal family. Now, really, in a lot of the black communities, the problem is the fact that you don't have a dad and young people are attracted to gangs because they don't have an authority figure in the family that they can, that they can establish as a role model. So how is overthrowing the patriarchal family going to help that situation? It's only going to make a bad problem even worse. So Dinesh, with all of this happening, it's like, we all see it and we all go, this is crazy. This is bizarre. Yet it's like, how do you, how do you fight against it? What do you do? It's like you, we get shut down on YouTube. We get shut down on Facebook. We get shut down all over the place. How, so how what, what this tells me is that we have been, uh, we as a group, very negligent in allowing the left to become so dominant on these platforms because they control them. Uh, I'm trying in small ways to create, you know, to support alternative platforms. So one good alternative, you know, to Twitter uh, is Parler. Uh, and uh, another alternative to YouTube is called Rumble. So I'm trying to build up these platforms, encourage them, because that way, uh, you know, there's a sword hanging over my head on these mainstream platforms. And if they drop the sword, I'll get banned. Now that hasn't happened to me yet, but it could happen. And I wanna make sure that if and when it does happen, I've built up strong platforms as alternatives. The reason I make movies is it's an end run around the media. So here's my movie. It's, you know, 300 million Americans can watch this movie at home. And there it is on Apple iTunes. Just go on your big screen TV, click and watch. So these are ways that we, we make, uh, we find our own way to reach the consumer and to educate people and enlighten them. Uh, and movies are a very powerful tool to do that. I mean, a book is useful because a book lays out an argument. It has references. But a movie is an emotional narrative that appeals both to the head and the heart. And my movies, at times, they, they're horror movies. They make you horrified and scared. But they also are moving. And at the end, I think they're also very inspirational and motivational. So let me ask this question. Um, you know, when you look at this defund the police, you know, I'm, I'm going on Fox to kind of debate this uh, hedge fund guy because he and... Uh, Bloomberg and Soros fund the def defund the police. Why would they do that? 
Why wouldn't they pay to get these prisoners released and defund the police? In my opinion, their goal is different than it appears on first glance. They don't want a society where there's no police because many of these guys, as you can see, are pretty rich guys. The last thing they want is a bunch of thugs smashing their front door and pulling down their art collection and taking all the nice stuff out of their homes. That would happen if there were no cops. Um, so what they really mean is they want to intimidate the police. They want to domesticate the police. They want the police to bow down to the ideological left. It's kind of what they achieve with the NBA and the Boy Scouts. They ultimately go and make these groups into adjuncts of the left. They want to be able to take the police and say, listen, when we break the law, look the other way. But when the other side does something wrong, we want to be able to tell you to go after them. They want to turn the police into weapons that are at their beck and call. Uh, all socialist states have tried to have a police, but not a real police. The police are basically a group of armed gangsters that do what the state wants. I think that's what the left is trying to achieve with this bogus slogan, defund the police. Well, that's why, you know, when I was um, coming to military school, we studied economics. A big part of the study was the brown shirts and the black shirts, because that was Hitler's private police, which became the SS, a lot of them. And, and that's how they murdered all the Jews and all this, because it all started in school. You know, Hitler started making little pamphlets about why people should hate Jews. And, and that's where the Hitler youth came up and all this. And my concern is, you know, as a former Marine, I see that happening today. And that's why I talk about being in Berkeley, California, during the 70s and being terrified of what I saw going on. So let me ask this question. What about this guy Biden and his son Hunter and was it the New York Post and then YouTube and Twitter block it? And, they, and you know, Zuckerberg and was it Dorsey, they say, screw you. We're, 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 and it's okay for us to do this. What do you think about that? All these guys know that the Bidens are thoroughly uh, corrupt. <laughs> now, by the way, uh, you know, you don't find this corruption in Scandinavia. You won't be able to find a single Scandinavian politician who has gone from zero to 50 million or 100 million euros. That doesn't happen. But it does happen in Venezuela. It's a corrupt gangster socialist class. And the Bidens are like the Clintons. Now, the Clintons did it through a foundation. Uh, the Bidens do it through extended family. So when Biden goes on a foreign trip, he takes a family member. Sometimes it's Hunter Biden, or sometimes it's one of his brothers, James or Frank Biden. And while uh, Joe Biden is having official meetings, the family member is making side deals with the foreign government that result in large amounts of cash ending up in the Biden's pockets. So this has been going on for years. This is how Biden has multiple homes, private planes, domestic staff. I mean, how can he afford this on a government salary? So the media knows that Biden is corrupt, but they're in his camp. Uh, and so what they want to do is hide the corruption, not report on the story, censor it where they have to, and try to drag this crook across the finish line in November. It, it almost <laughs> it's, seems- it's, it's, it's actually a precedent Kamala. Is the yeah, real issue that's another issue. That's, that's, that's the real precedent. Uh, but it seems like the media and all of the left have gotten so brazen that they don't even care that we know it's fake. We, we know that it's corrupt. We, they don't even care that we- are finding these things out. It's like they're just putting it out there anyway and they're gonna do whatever they're gonna do. It's like there's no opposition to this. This is very important. In the past, there was a pretense of objectivity. Uh, and you could, uh, the advantage of having a pretense of objectivity is you could sometimes call the media to a higher standard and say, look, you're covering Reagan in a completely different way than you're covering Mondale. And it'd be like, oh yeah, maybe we should at least pretend to be fair. But now they don't even pretend to be fair. And it's kind of silly to point out their double standards because they're so blatant. And it's very clear they don't even believe in any objectivity or higher standards. So I think we just have to reduce the power of the media in our own minds and recognize that when you're dealing with media, these people are not a media or a press in the traditional sense. When you think of a press, a free press, you know, the founders, the right to a free press, they were thinking of an independent group of people who were outside the government, not captive to any side, that would apply critical scrutiny to the government and give the public information that they could use to make their own decisions about what's true, what's false, what's believable, what's not. But we don't have a media in that sense. The media is kind of like a lobbying arm of the democratic left. So let me ask, this is the, I think the biggest question of all, you know, talk about divided America. You know, today we have families that won't talk to each other. I was just talking to my really good friend 
talking about my friend Chad, and his brother won't talk to him because Chad likes Trump and his brother likes Biden. And his brother's a capitalist. They hate each other. He's a capitalist. He's a business guy. Have you seen that too, Dinesh? I have seen that, and it's puzzled me initially, and I think it has to be, I think, that these business guys are economically conservative but socially liberal, and that their social values are trumping their economic interests. Because anyone, by and large, who is um, an innovator, a risk taker, a capitalist making money, Um, It's illogical. It makes no sense unless you're a profoundly stupid individual for you to be voting for the Democrats. So it's got to be that there's some other factor. uh, And I'm assuming that it's the social liberalism that is that is uh, predominant uh, so that these entrepreneurs and even these Silicon Valley guys are on the left for that reason. Final words here. How does a person fight back? And I highly suggest people read your books and watch your uh, your documentaries and movies and stuff like this because a well-informed uh, group has more power than one who is just hiding from uh, YouTube and Big Brother. Any, any comments for people? Yeah, I think that um, uh, just to give my own example, the reason that I can say and speak freely is because I'm not captive to Hollywood. Even though I have a film company, um, I am not part of their world and I don't care about them. And there's nothing they can do to me. Whereas there are conservatives in Hollywood who are screenwriters and they're actors and they rely for jobs on the studios. So look at the leverage that those institutions have over them. If they say the wrong thing, they're out of a job. Uh, They'll never work in this town again. So naturally there's an element of fear that goes with that. Uh, I've tried to to develop my career in a way that I'm independent of all that, which gives me a freedom to speak. Um, And I think we should, those of us who are in a position to do that need to break down these taboos, ridicule them mercilessly. I would love to see a comedy channel of young people who are politically incorrect to the max, who absolutely savage every piety and ridicule every pomposity and make fun of all kinds of taboos and are absolutely uncensored. And what can you do? Um, Nothing. This would become probably the biggest show on the internet worldwide. So if the world is crying out for the intellectual freedom of people being able to truly speak their minds and give all these censors the middle finger. Well said. Oh boy, that's that's, that's one of the best ideas I've ever heard. You have the power and the uh, wherewithal to do that. So anyway, thank you, Dinesh. You know, keep up the great work. Thank you, Dinesh. I'd love to have you back on the program. Yeah, I appreciate it because, like I said, the definition of an intelligence is if you agree with me, you're extremely intelligent. And Dinesh's Dinesh's book is The United States of Socialism. Buy that book now, United States of Socialism. Excellent. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And we'll be right back for our final words. Thank you. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki. This might be the last program you ever hear from us. We'll probably be deplatformed from this one. But anyway, I want to thank Dinesh D'Souza. It's, it's D-I-N-E-S-H-D-S-O-U-Z-A. I mean, he's got a lot of guts to say what it does. And um, I give him credit for the courage. So once again, listen to the Rich Dad Radio Show program anytime, anywhere on, on Rich Dad Radio. I mean, uh, good news and bad news about money. We'll do our best to not get deplatformed. You can listen to Rich Dad Radio anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android and YouTube. And please leave us a review whenever you listen. <clears throat> and to hear this podcast again, go to richdadradio.com. We, we repeat the program. We make it available to you so you can listen to it again because you'll, you'll learn twice as much a second time. But more importantly, especially this program, listen to, listen to with friends, family, and business associates especially if they're communists, okay? I think they should really listen to this program. <laughs> well, you know, one, one of the things Dinesh said that was like, oh man, I can't believe he, I can't believe, but it's true. When he said, you know, U.S. is like Venezuela. I'm like, like Venezuela? He goes, yeah, it's a corrupt gangster class. They vote We're a corrupt in, gangster class. They vote in the person that kills them. Okay? Oh, so what do you think, sir? So the one thing that I wrote down kind of close to the beginning of the interview was you had asked him, how are people like Ocasio-Cortez or Bernie Sanders, how do they come into popularity? And he said, it's the art of creating a sense of grievance, which is so true because it's that like mentality, like, oh, I've been harmed in some way. And that's what I I have my new book coming out soon. Hopefully soon. I'm working on a whole year now. 
It's called The Infinite Return, and Dinesh plays right into it because, you know, I'm a U.S. Marine. I fought against socialism and communism. I mean, I fought for the freedom to choose. But anyway, the definition of socialism is a victim recruiting victims. And so they have to have victims, and they get you all in one big pot, and then they kill you. Like I said, when I studied, I mean, econo economy, economics at the academy, it really was body count. Who killed the most people? And over history, socialists have murdered the most people. Hitler, you know, the, the Jews got, got it up to six million, but he, Hitler really, it was national, Nazi as national socialist, national socialist. He murdered 18 million total. You know, when you count all the other races who weren't Jews. And then Lenin and Stalin, it was 26 million. And then Mao Zedong was something like 28 million. And so that's why socialists have always had to kill the victim well, that they recruited. It's happening right now with COVID. Yeah. With COVID, more people are going to be dying out of mental problems and financial problems than are going to actually die of COVID. And even those numbers are false. Don't say that too loud because we'll be. <laughs> oh, jeez! <laughs> but yeah, it's happening right now. The left has, has done this whole worldwide global thing against COVID, isolated people, done everything that is going to jeopardize people's lives. And they don't care. They've taken they away care. their income. Income. I mean, freedom. Like they have freedom. Stripped, freedom. They're locked they in your house. Stripped everything away. Yeah. Like in the beginning, um, we were on a group chat with my family, and it was like, oh, that dangerous. We're gonna. <laughs> typically, it is. Well, they were like, oh, we're gonna. They're. We're hearing that the states are shutting down. The government. Trump's gonna shut down the country, and my response back was impossible. It would never happen in America. What happened a week later? Everything was shut down. Yep. I mean, it's to me unimaginable that we're experiencing this in the yeah, United States. But the other thing Dinesh said is one of the outcomes is to have every single person dependent upon the government. Yep. That's socialism. That's big, and that's what's big happening. Government. It's yep. also called Big Brother. It's also called Silicon Valley. Now, mm -hmm. on the good side of it, Silicon Valley does a lot of good. And the good news today, as we speak, this is October, what, 20th or something? The U.S., I mean, Big Brother, I Google and Facebook and all those guys are being sued or being called to on the carpet for our antitrust. And that's what, you know, democracy should, democracy should be. We should be able to call the little sons of a bitches onto the carpet and say, how can you censor? I mean, how can you censor the New York Post article that, that exposes Joe, I mean, Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden. Do you know I mean, how can we censor that? What has happened to this country? And why is, why is it I'm so afraid to be politically incorrect? And why have so many comedians been taken off air? Because we, we can't tell jokes anymore. And I think that's the greatest of all tragedies. We've lost our sense of humor. So that's, I think, the ultimate price of socialism. Final words, Kim? Well, I do like what Dinesh said. You know, we do need to speak up when we can and not be afraid to speak up. I also like that he said he's building his presence on the site's par parlor and rumble. So when the Facebooks and Googles and all of the others, um, YouTube, when they start getting out of hand and start taking off everybody that does not sing to their philosophy, you still have a voice. We need to keep our voice. I, I like this idea of having a, a show, much like Saturday Night Live yeah, once was, but the lit went left, dark great. left, that you can be dark right, you know, mm -hmm. whatever the show would be. It would be funny. I'd, I'd tune into that, wouldn't you, Sarah? Oh, right. yeah, definitely. In I a think heartbeat. that's a brilliant idea. Yep. But let's have fun. This time we get our sense of humor back. Anyway, thank you for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show. Thank you to Dinesh D'Souza. And thank you all for listening.